We are so excited to have Mildred Howard with us today. SF MoMA, the de Young, San Jose Museum, the New Museum in New York. Mildred Howard has created a body of work which has been exhibited and collected by museums throughout the United States and beyond. Paris, Berlin, Cairo, awards for her objects, projects, and installations have included the Adeline Kent Award from the San Francisco Art Institute, a fellowship from the Fleischhacker Foundation, and a grant from the Joan Mitchell Foundation. What has brought Mildred here today is rooted in a different listing. Stanford, Brown, the San Francisco Art Institute, California College of the Arts, a listing which continues. The Exploratorium, the Edible Garden, Alameda County Juvenile Hall. Mildred Howard is a committed educator who has placed her work, her energies, her consideration at the service of youth, the environment, and social change. Her sculpture addresses history, racism, and politics. Her installations stand as metaphors, evocative of raw emotion and deep reflection. This spirit has imbued projects with youth in Oakland, and it has crossed cultural divides to spark youth in Morocco. It is a far-reaching insight which Mildred Howard brings to us today. Please welcome Mildred. Thank you. I think I came at this um, sort of the, the academic part of my world slightly askew. And I guess that's how my life has been as an artist. I, I started off as, as a dancer. I danced for maybe 20, 25 years. And um, in fact, when I graduated, I, I'm also a native of San Francisco like Leo. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from Berkeley High School, um, my dance teacher said, well, did you apply for a scholarship? And I said to her, I can. And I said, well, where should I go? She said, you can go anywhere you want to go. And for, I didn't know that. I, you know, I thought that people got scholarships through osmosis. <laughs> and um, so um, it was like the height of the 60s, and all my friends were going to Oakland City College, which was the birthplace of the Black Panther Party. So I wanted to go to Oakland City College mm -hmm. instead of going to UC Berkeley. And I wanted to take classes with Ruth Beckford, who founded the Dance Part uh, program here at UC Berkeley. But at the same time I was doing that, I was uh, studying fashion. I was always drawing and putting things together and making things. And when I got to Oakland City College and went into my counselor's office, he said, well, you know, people like you really shouldn't go to college. And then I left out thinking, what did he mean by people like me? And as I was walking home about, I guess it was maybe less than a mile, uh, to, I, I was kind of embarrassed, but at the same time I knew I had a mission. Uh, and I just wish I could find that man today. <laughs> but when you're young and naive, you're somewhat embarrassed and somewhat just not sure of how... Uh, you're gonna make things work, but I knew that my path was gonna be a creative one. UC Berkeley is really interesting because um, I got a lot of my training here without having to pay. My kids and I began modeling here when they were about two and a half years old. So, I mean, at that point, they were actually the youngest children to be in the, um, um, artist co-op, and so I had them, I dem they wanted to pay them less, but I said no. <laughs> they are doing just what I'm doing, so they got regular wages. And this is my daughter on the left now, or then, a few, 96, yeah. And so um, they would save their money, buy their art clothes, and at the same time, we got an art education from listening to the instructors. Who are some of your favorite instructors? that you sat for? Uh, I'm trying, I didn't, Jim was here. Jim was here? Uh, who was, else was here when you were here, Jim? Mary O'Neill was here. 
Uh, yeah, he was here. And then they would have these large drawing, like marathons, all day long. And you would pose maybe a whole day. And I think at the time, and what artists were making, maybe $15 an hour. And I just, you know, that was a fortune at that time. I remember when the, when the San Francisco Museum had all day marathons with models and they were free for everyone to go in and draw. And so, you know, what I have done is just juggled like working in various realms and um, making art and raising a family. And it's, it's interesting because I go back from teaching to doing art administration and um, to working in my studio, but it's all a part. And, Whatever it takes to, to make my art, that's what I do. I mean, it's just the way it worked out for me. Um, what I find interesting about this whole thing is that oftentimes young people, the first thing they want to do is have a gallery, um, you know, full spread and all the magazines and make a lot of money before they even learn the craft. Mm -hmm. And I came up at a time when it was like, you know, it wasn't like learning how to do, say, ASDFG space semicolon LKJH space, you know, like a typewriter. Typewriters, I mean, it's, it wasn't like learning how to type. Uh, and it was pre-computers. It took you at least even, you know, 15 years to even understand yourself and what you were trying to do. And now I was faced with young people who wanted, boom, instant success. And it was more about the, the, the bling and the, and the flash rather than about learning how to make something. And so I, I even find that today, um, whether it's teaching at UC Berkeley, Stanford, you know, I do the art shuffle in, in, in the academic world or, or speaking at some university, it's all the same. They, they want this instant success, but they better step back. And you know, the, my thing is you better learn as much as you can. And then when you think you've learned it all, you better go back and try again. So I, I go and I work in various media. I too get bored very easily. And by the time I'm working in one, um, I'm interested in another or halfway through than the other idea. My work has been um, informed by um, memory and place and history. And through my work at the Exploratorium, it's about everyday experiences and how I view the world. Uh, I, think, I see art artists as chronicles of history. Um, in that they see things in a particular way, and um, and then they architect, uh, then they they ar articulate that visually. Uh, oftentimes, I, I'll say I know how to do something when I don't, and then I try to figure it out, <laughs> or I'll go ask someone, "How do I do this?" or "How do I do that?" I. I I, did, I don't have an undergraduate degree in um, painting and drawing and all of that. I actually have an MFA in textiles. And I got that because I applied to, that was when we had, in Berkeley, there was a place called Fiberworks Center for the Textile Arts. Mm -hmm. And they were in conjunction with Lone Mountain College. Mm -hmm. So I just happened to pass by there one day to figure out what that was. and what place it was, and then the director said, oh, well, I have a job here, why don't you take it? So I, I ended up working there, and then I said, well, why don't I just apply to go to the graduate program? And so, yes, by the time I got into the graduate program, Lone Mountain had, uh, had closed something, it went defunct, I think it was BART by UC, and then they were scrambling trying to find um, a university to get their accreditation. So um, JFK was out in Narenda. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted that MFA, and I wanted to fit, do it my way. And so since it allowed me to do it my way, take classes with whoever I wanted to, and get my degree, then that's what I did. And so I said, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about those pieces with the houses? They look like they're made out of, what, I can't tell. 
they're made out of bottles and vials. All of these are made out, and these are, yeah. And, and I, I, I became interested in these, this whole series of memory gardens, as I call them, because I also, you know, I, I was exploring the whole African diaspora, the, uh, at this time, the whole um, Harlem Renaissance era. And because I was going to school and I didn't see anything that talked about me or people who looked like me or referenced that in any kind of way. And so I, was, I read this autobiography of James Weldon Johnson's autobiography of an ex-colored man. And this is what set me on this journey of making these. So, and I've been making them since 1989. I mean, every time I make one, I said I'm gonna quit. But, but I don't. So, and then they've led to this one, The Black Bird and the Red Sky, AKA Follow the Blood House. Um, huh? This one? This is big enough to walk in. You could probably set a dining room table in it and some chairs. These? They're small. They're, they sit on a pedestal. I guess they're like maybe vary in size from 20 by, or 30 by 20 by 20 or, or a little bigger. These are floating glass apples in the pool. Mm. What's that? Yeah, they're, no, I, didn't, I had them blown. So if I don't know how to do something, I find someone who does <laughs> and get them to do that. Uh, this is a piece I did for the, uh, actually I did it first for, um, I did it for the San Jose Museum in one of their renovations. And it was their opening exhibition. So I've, this actually is my first one, and this is the very first one that I did that was originally at the Headland Center for the Arts. And um, I was a resident there, and also working at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, teaching the integration of art and science. So reflection, refraction, light going through, shadow, sound, all of those things were captured in this spot, in this place. And so I continue to make things based on things that I didn't see and also things that were a part of my life and how can what I do inform others? Because in actuality, we have more in common than we have differences. Um, this piece right here, parenthetically speaking, it's only a figure of speech. Uh, I was invited to Pilchuck, and at Pilchuck I was able to work with some incredible gaffers. And so I didn't know what I, in fact, I wasn't going to go, and, and I'm thinking, oh God, should I go up there? Because it's cold, it's rural, and you know, I'm into the city and comfort. <laughs> and so I went up there and it was one of the best experiences, and these are oversized punctuation marks that I had them blow. I guess the largest might be about 48 inches by 16 inches, were and by, by 10 inches in depth. They're all blown glass. Were they work from drawings of yours? They work, yeah. I just, I drew a bunch of punctuation marks and worked with them and said I want, so I ended up getting 52 punctuation marks. It hangs on the wall. They all hang on the wall. They're words that, uh, it's, it's like a poem without words. And it's based on a poem that uh, the poet Quincy Troop did about the end. And I, I didn't bring that one, unfortunately, the poem or else I would have read it. And then um, for some reason, um, I decided, okay, I, I, no one's going to hire me. How else can I make money? And there was a, a call for proposals at the, by the San Francisco Art Commission on the renovation of the San Francisco Art uh, uh, international Airport. Yeah, and so I said, okay, I'm going to apply for this and see what happens. And surprisingly, this was my first big public art project that I got. And on here, for those of you who can read music, it's the first four movements of Salt Peanuts. And these are all saxophones. They're a hundred 
and 30 plus or minus saxophones, all kinds, C melodies, little toy ones, big uh, baritone saxophones, just all kinds that I collected from all over the world. And this is because just like the East Coast, somehow the coast, they seem to think that they're the first on everything. But, you know, the right and the left coast, there have always been movements going on. Here we are on the Pacific Rim. And then, you know, the East Coast is on the Atlantic and, and has things coming in. And music was happening here. And then particularly in the Western edition, or I used to call, I would call it the Fillmore. And it was happening at the same time that it was happening in other places in this country. And so this piece is about that. And this, these are keys that line Stevenson Street in San Francisco. Stevenson Street is near where they had, and I think it was in the 30s or early 40s, um, in San Fran, uh, there was a, a big, um, strike with the longshoremen's and it shut down everything. So this is a tribute to, um, uh, what's this, uh, Harry Bridges, who was the founder of the ILWU. And I'm really pro-union because it gives you, it gave us weekends, it gave us sick leave, it gave us uh, 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 like pensions and a, a salary and I, I really am support of unions that really address the needs of people. Because right now in this country, if that maniac gets in, we are all <laughs> fucked up. And so, and here's a piece that I, I worked with um, Glide on this piece. And again, I wanted to, uh, involve the community, the, that the constituents of Glide. It, it's an affordable housing project. And so I, I contacted Janice Mirakatani, who was at that time the poet laureate of San Francisco. And I wanted her to bring a group of people who might be living in this 14-story residential housing. And I said that I wanted them to discuss this whole notion of home. What does home mean to you? And how what would it be like? So they came up with words and phrases, and as a result, um, this poem goes uh, across the surface of the first two stories of the building, and it weaves in and out. So, you know, amazing grace wakes us to the beauty of this home. This is the end of it. And this also was based on my inspiration was, I was also in Italy when I um, applied for this project, and I wanted something that would make people stop and maybe not get it right away, but something that would compel them to stop and to read it. And it was how the light changes and how you're able to read this at different times and how it looks. And here's another. This is uh, the next key project in um, Novato. And there are a series of keys that go from straight to bent, from bent to straight. And it's a um, a training program for people who are living on the edge who may have uh, don't, not have a place to stay, form a homeless, and they tra you could actually live there for a year or so and be trained in some kind of uh, vocation that you can go and get a job. And this is a youth center that I worked with, Johanna Pothik. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the idea of this, this wall of perception came from Richard Gregory, who's a, a physicist in Bath. And so it looks as though the walls, are, the tile is uneven, but when in fact it is. And I had the students come up with words of, what is your perception of oneself? How do you feel about, and they came up with words that are, are on the tile so that when you look in the mirror, the words are reversed, okay. And then, of course, the Blue Bridge that bridges the, the, various, commun it's the, the various communities of the Western edition. It's a poem that talks about it. And when I did this, uh, it reminded me of my youth also. And for me, it was like hearing the cityscapes, the, the sound of the cityscapes, your footsteps, 
uh, the smell of the food, the mixture of the culture, which brings spice to life as far as I'm concerned, and how that relates to jazz. So, and the blues, of course, is the root, one of the roots of jazz. And this is a piece that I'm working on that'll be done in up by probably June this year. It's a big rococo frame that's gonna sit up on the hill at Hunter's Point. And you can actually walk through it. And here I am, you know, this is I, one of my teaching gigs. This is in Morocco. Yeah. And this is in Oaxaca. I've got a bunch of San Francisco Art Institute students there. Did you blow glass in Oaxaca? No, I don't blow glass. I mean, did you have someone? No, I didn't do glass because it's more ceramics. Oh, right. Yeah, more ceramics and printmaking. And a series of prints that I just did this year at Sharks Inc. And I was looking at this whole notion of what spade means. And spade has so many different meanings. And so on each one of these uh, Shinkule mono prints, I have a spade. And I did, um, I was there for a week and I was, did 22 mono prints and I was just getting warmed up. And that's the thing, you just get warmed up and then you, I had to leave. It, it reminds me of Charlie Mingus, or no, not Charlie Mingus. Um, he lived uh, another saxophone. Oh, Jackie McLean, who said that uh, just as soon as I get my chops up, I have to go back to teach, so I had to come back. This is a series of pieces that I've done on the world and borders, and you know, I think borders oftentimes are ridiculous in how they're set and changed, and so everything has to do with the globe. I'm interested in globes and maps and all of that, and a few more of my bottle houses. This is the latest one that I've done. I was up for a year in Palo Alto. And another one that I did at the same time. And this will go up on the uh, Richmond BART station, hopefully by January. Um, again, I worked with a group of the, the literacy uh, group at, in Richmond. And I got Ishmael Reed to uh, do a poem for me, and then I took a piece of paper and I folded it and unfolded it to get my ideas together and all the words are in the negative space. So you see the shadow behind the piece. And these are out of Cortin steel, they're I think 12 by 40 feet. And this will be for San Francisco General whenever they open. <laughs> Oops, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Amazing. Mildred, I don't know if you remember. One of I also, you know, to supplement my art. Career, I worked in a lot of museums installing art, but one of my first gigs installing art was one of Mildred's glass houses at the uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. I think it was the opening show. Of no, not the glass. That, that was the oh, no, no, wax was feet. The, 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 the wax the, feet. Yes, that's oh, what Oh, I it was. forgot about that yeah. piece. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was my first. Uh, yeah. Mildred was my first big installation piece that I installed. <laughs> there were, I think I had 400 wax feet for this project. I had gone to Brazil. That was in the, what, mid-90s? Uh-huh. Mid-90s. And I went to uh, Salvador Bahia. I, I was there with Raymond Saunders, Saunders and his whole contingency. And um, I, we went to the Church of Bofin, and they had, it was, this church was all this ornate gold. And then they had tons of wax feet. And I just, it was just like a living installation. And when I came back, I read in the newspaper that an African American male had a better chance, a 25% chance of going to, college, going to jail rather than college. And so I said, oh God, you know, right when you think there's light at the end of the tunnel. So that piece actually 
is based on that. Were there tr railroad tracks too in that piece? If no, it's just that. The I railroad tracks was a, a different piece yeah. that I did on the Freedom Trail in Boston. Yeah. Nice. Yeah.